Alfred Hitchcock is one of the great filmmakers in motion picture history. Known as the master of suspense, he has come to define an entire genre in film, now synonymous with his name. His extraordinary body of work includes such classics as Notorious, Rear Window, North by Northwest, Psycho, and The Birds. This year marks the 100th anniversary of his birth. The Museum of Modern Art here in New York is celebrating with a retrospective of his work. Joining me now, the filmmaker's only child, Pat Hitchcock O'Connell. Director Peter Bogdanovich, who knew him for over two decades and interviewed him on several occasions. Also here, Lawrence Kardish, curator of MoMA's Department of Film and Video and the Hitchcock Exhibition. I'm pleased to have all of them here. Let me begin. We'll begin with you. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about him uh, in terms of, of a, what you think made him uh, the genius that he was, the filmmaker that he was. I think the genius, uh, why he was such a genius is he, he knew everything from, of a script from the very beginning when he worked with my mother, strangely enough, that mm. she was very much a part of it. And he worked on it all the way through. And then when he had a finished script, he took a pad with rectangles on and he drew every single scene in that picture. He then went over it with the cameraman. And so when he got to the set, he knew what that picture was going to look yeah. like. So that he was able then to devote his time to the actors who he, who he really liked. He really didn't think they were cattle <laughs> or should be treated yeah. like cattle. <laughs> Peter, you know the world of directing. What? What made him stand out for you? Well, I think Pat's right. He, he had an extraordinary sense of the whole picture. He made the picture in his head first. Then he got it down on paper, and then he made it, you know, uh, for, the, for the world. He just had an amazing sense of uh, what the picture was going to look like, and he also had a great sense of, of drama. He knew how much information to give to an audience, which is the key to suspense, is actually giving the audience information, not withholding it. He believed in, in suspense over shock. He didn't see any point in, in surprising an audience if he could hold them in suspense by giving them information. Why did he do suspense? I mean, what was it about suspense that made it his favorite form of... Well, I don't know exactly. I don't know exactly, but I mean, it, 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 the whole idea of a crime as a genre uh, is, is much more highly thought of in, in England, which is where he was from, than it is than it used to be in America. I think it's more respected now than it was when Hitch was actually making pictures. Uh, and so, you know, it, it was it, the crime as a as a crime as a uh, as a kind of a genre is is very much of a standard thing in in in, in England, yeah. for example, which is where he came from. And. Um, I think it fascinated him. I, mean, I, I think yeah, the, the trials, that's what he loved. The trials. For the early trials uh, were fascinating to him. And he used to follow them. And he has, I have all the books that were his. And uh, this absolutely mesmerized him. He loved it. But he got enjoyment out of it. Mm. He just wasn't fascinated with the crime, per se. But it was also then, what do you, how do you put the humor in? which people laugh at, and they say humor and crime, you know. But that's, that's what he did, and he made the audience, he gave them a chance to relax. He would build up the hair and then make them, let them take relax, breath, yeah. you know, and take a breath, and then go on from there. Yeah. How do you put together a retrospective like this? Well, this one wasn't all that difficult, because fortunately, almost all of his British films are preserved in the National Film and Television Archives in London. And all we had to do was clear the rights. The rights are owned by a company in France, Canal Plus, and a company in London, Carlton International. So that, that part was easy. We're also at the museum members of the International Federation of Film Archives. So we call up our, our colleagues around the world to see if they have this print or that print. Right. And also we have the cooperation of companies like Universal Studios, they're loaning us 13 mint prints, and also the Time Warner people, and, their, and the Turner Library, which is spectacular. What's the high point of the exhibition for you? For me, it's the early films that are fairly rare that have not been seen here. For instance, there's a film called Downhill that we just screened, which has an atrocious reputation. 
I think it's a masterwork. Right. Uh, and uh, I was, I think, it doesn't, you don't quite rewrite history with Downhill, but you come <laughs> darn close to it. Yeah. You have interviewed directors, you have studied directors, you have written about film. Um, where do you, where do you rank him? I mean, oh, I think he's up there with the, with the great, with the great masters of America. Great masters. Of, 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 of cinema, yes, world cinema, certainly. He's had a tremendous impact on, on movies. What uh, was the impact? Well, I think uh, in terms of how he presented stories, he had an extraordinary uh, ability to go from subjective use of movies to an objective use. He had a brilliant way of putting the viewer in the place of the, of the leading character or even the villain. Uh, I think he's, you know, it's no coincidence that um, you go into a video store and you see drama, musicals, comedies, Hitchcock. Hitchcock, yes. You know, there's no other director that has that. Uh, Can you point to something that you learned from him? Oh, so many things. I mean, the thing I mentioned before, the difference between shock and surprise, right. uh, shock and, and suspense, that's a, a big thing. Uh, there's his famous story about the MacGuffin, you know, uh, you know that... Uh, the, the, that thing in a movie that all the characters are interested in, but the audience isn't. Yeah. Uh, the difference between that and, and what is interesting to an audience. Um, so many things in terms of where you put the camera, why you put the camera, where you put it, and, and uh, uh, w w when you're in a high angle, when you're in a low angle, what all that means. He never did anything, you know, arbitrarily. He never it made was a all thought, as you suggested. It he'd all was all planned for a reason. Yeah. You know? yeah. I saw last night by uh, first time I'd ever seen it the 3D version of Dial M for Murder, which is the way he originally made the picture. It wasn't released that way because 3D had sort of lost its impact. It was extraordinary to me to see this, like seeing a new Hitchcock picture, seeing. That's why he put the camera there, because it would have this effect and that effect, whatever it was. You know, it was, it, it, it was always thinking. You could, you could feel why he did things, you know. How long did the television series go? About 11 years. 11 years. About 11 years, yes. Yeah. Well, he started off with the half-hour shows, uh, mm. and then they went into our shows, which were not as successful, because you couldn't find stories. Uh, a novel was too long, a short story was too short. With the uh, half-hour shows, it was great, and there was an actor called Norman Lloyd who was a producer, and they started in on this thing of do him doing the lead-ins, and Norman said, he'll never do this, Hitch will never do these lead-ins. He loved it. <laughs> every had more fun doing yeah. lead-ins. See, that's you put him in front of a camera oh, that's every it. time. That's right? He was wonderful too. He was great. He was, he was because actor. he had such a defined, <clears throat> distinct style, personality, personality. Yes, and the audience keyed into that. You yeah. know, that they really enjoyed him. They do you do, do, do a Hitchcock I do. I, I thought that he's that very that's good. good. Let's see. He right. does the best yeah. one. Well, I said to him once. Uh, um, w I asked him how he'd shot Psycho, the uh, shower scene. He says, well, the Paramount Special Effects Department made for me a torso entirely of rubber. When you plunge the knife in, blood would spurt out. Oh, it was wonderful. I didn't <laughs> use it at all. <laughs> He's good. Isn't he great? Yeah. <laughs> well, you're the, be the best one. <laughs> Rotate. This is Alfred Hitchcock. Having seen that, talking about one of his films, Marnie. How do you do? I am Alfred Hitchcock, and I would like to tell you about my latest motion picture, Marnie, which will be coming to this theater soon. Marnie is a very difficult picture to classify. It is not psycho, nor do we have a horde of birds flapping about and pecking at people willy-nilly. We do have two very interesting human specimens, a man and a woman. One might call Marnie a sex mystery, that is, if one used such words. Did he have a film that he prized more than any other? Yes. What was it? Shadow of a Doubt. It was from a script by uh, Thornton Wilder, yeah. and he loved bringing menace into a small town, Santa Rosa, <laughs> in Northern California. Oh, I know Santa Rosa, yeah. And he had a brilliant cast, he had people he loved in the cast. Joseph yeah. Cotton, one of yeah. his favorite actors, Teresa Wright, Hume Cronin, Patricia Collins, 
And it was uh, it was his very favorite movie, and written by Thornton Wilder. Wow, can't go much. You like this that. one? Oh yes, yeah, wonderful film. He 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 was happy with it. One of the reasons he was happy with it, he, he said, was because it, it gave him an opportunity to bring characters into the picture more than he normally could with a suspense story. And he really, it was really a character piece, and and he liked that about it. And I think he also liked working with Thornton Wilder and felt respect from Wilder and. And of course, it was mutual. Did he consider himself, to use a bad word, auteur, that, that he was, did he consider himself simply a storyteller who made movies of a suspense nature, or did he know and feel and define himself as this kind of film auteur? No, he, he was a man who told a story. He wanted to tell that story in the best way he could. Did he think he was an artist? Rather than I just don't a, think so. Just a filmmaker story. So no, I don't think he he did. It was amazing. Once he had made a picture, and then gone out to sell the picture, he forgot all about that picture. And now we would go on to the next one. Mm. But we regard him as an artist, and Peter was one of the one of the first in this country to do so. He did the first retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art in 1963, and uh, I think that the film. Our first curator, Iris Barry, certainly considered him an artist as early as the late 20s. Mm -hmm. A good interview, Peter? Oh, he was great. He was a great interview because he was very, you know, he had a, he, one of the things that I remember best about, most about him was his, uh, the contagious enthusiasm yeah. with which he would describe a sequence that he had already shot, maybe 20 years before, or that he was going to shoot. In, in a couple of years. Is, is there anyone who's making films today that, that you see a direct link between Hitchcock and... Well, you know, so many directors were, were influenced by from, him, you know, yeah. like obviously Brian De Palma and Roman Polanski right. and uh, just about everybody, really. I, it, it, I feel uh, he would have loved Spielberg. Really? Because Spielberg makes his audiences, rather makes his films for the people, for the audience, and audiences don't change. <laughs> and he, he, he learned a lot from Hitch. I mean, you look at Jaws yeah. and you see effect after effect that he took directly from Hitchcock. Spielberg's a student of film. Oh, yes. 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 Now, tell me about the dark side. Well, there wasn't an awful lot of dark side, really. Uh, he, uh, when he was working, it was work. Yeah. And when he was at home, he was really, I hate to disappoint everybody, but he was very quiet, yeah. uh, loved reading. But he was read. a happy man? Yes, yes, yes. Mm. He, he wasn't nearly as depressed as everybody thought he was. No, no, there's a perception. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a myth in your judgment. Yes, in my judgment. Yeah, now, is. there were times, yes, that he wasn't but, always happy on the set. But daughters protect dad, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, there were times, naturally, when he wasn't happy with something, yeah. you know, but all only to do with the picture. Yeah. How about casting? Who was his favorite? Was it Stewart? Uh, I think he loved yep. Jimmy Stewart because he personified the ordinary man. The ordinary man could look up on that screen and say, that could be me going through that. He loved yeah. Cary Grant for adventure films, adored Grace Kelly and Ingrid Bergman. Not, not you know. a bad group of actors no. to like, is it, Peter? <laughs> no, those, those, those pretty good, yeah. You can do well with those four. <laughs> <laughs> Roll tape. This is uh, Vertigo, 1958, the final scene of the film in which James Stewart is trying to save Kim Nolan. Speaking of actors, Peter, how did he work with actors? <coughs> well, you know, because the idea is, which I'm, I'm, I'm interrupting you, but the notion is in some quarters, you know, that actors, as you said, early alluded to, that was not true, but that I mean, he was really, had, he made the film himself and basically um, all you had to do was follow his, the stuff that he'd already done, that he was a genius at planning the film, that the execution was an afterthought. Well, it wasn't an afterthought, but he used to say that that was when he says, one doesn't enter the area of compromise <laughs> until you enter the sound stage. <laughs> and if the actor did as he wanted, uh, uh, I think he felt the actor brought whatever he brings to the scene. 
and uh, and he was very open to things that actors would bring. Tony Perkins told me that it was his idea, Tony's, to have eating the candy corn in the scene with Martin Balsam in Psycho, and that Hitch loved it. Uh, he didn't say, no, I didn't think of that, therefore I don't want it. On the contrary. Yeah, okay. uh, Hitch told me that the last moment in To Catch a Thief, when um, Grace Kelly says, oh, mother will like it so much here, and Carrie does a kind of take, that was Carrie's, he said, Hitch said, that was Carrie's idea. Carrie said, let the camera roll, will you, Hitch, I have an idea. And it was a funny last moment, and Hitch left, obviously left it in. So I think he was very open to actors. What bothered him was things like when Montgomery Cliff, coming out of the church, or coming out of the uh, Hall of Justice, and I confess, and Hitch said, look up, will you? And Monty Cliff said, well, I don't know if I would look up. And Hitch said, well, if you don't look up, I can't cut, you know, because <laughs> he's got to cut to something. Yeah. That sort of thing, that sort of thing would drive him crazy. It bothered him, I remember, for years. He said, what? He says, I don't know if I would look up. Why? Well, you know. <laughs> I don't would care just, if you don't look up. You know, my God. He said, look you know, up. Monty Cliff was too obscure in his yeah. methods, he said. <laughs> All right, take a look at this. Dial M for murder, Grace Kelly being attacked by an intruder, fights back with a pair of scissors. Here it is. That was 3D. You showed that you mentioned that that if you saw that in 3D, the hand just the hand came right just comes. Look, you, you felt like you could reach out and touch yeah. it. It was amazing, and it was also the first time in the entire picture that he did that effect. Uh, and it's about, you know, 40 minutes into the movie. John Williams, you love the performance. Oh, John, John Williams, Williams was wonderful. Yeah. He was an old friend of mine. We'd done plays together. And he was a brilliant character actor. Yeah. Just got laughs that, uh, he got oh, laughs that weren't wonderful. there, you know. Yes. yes. You yes. call the exhibition Behind the Silhouette. That's the gallery exhibition. Yes. Right. Why? Uh, because it, uh, it reveals some of his methods and techniques. We have a lot of drawings the drawings that he did that he gave to the to the cameraman. Mm -hmm. We also have uh, letters that were that he wrote and were written uh, to him as well. Now, where do so, you find these? We, thanks to thanks Patricia. To Not all the, the letters. Of mo mine were mostly pictures. Right. The letters were uh, at the academy. We had given all his papers, which were in files. You know, we never went through files, mm -hmm. so we just gave yeah. them to the academy. But I think the, the, the greatest story about finding anything, my uh, oldest daughter was living in a town outside of Los Angeles called Agoura, and she called me and she says, Mom, there's a trunk in the garage, and I think it's got some of Grandpa's things in. So I said, well, I think I'd better come and look over it, Mary. I go out, I, I open this trunk, there is a handwritten script of Shadow of a Doubt by oh. Thornton Wilder. Oh I die. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Let me look at one more clip here, all courtesy of the of Momer. This is Strangers on a Train, 1951, out of control, merry-go-round. You know the story. Here it is. He told you, Peter, this is one of his more difficult scenes? Yes, because there's a lot of rear projection in those shots when they're on the uh, on the carousel and when you're seeing him hitting all that movement behind there done with, uh, with the rear projection. Every time they sh change the angle, they'd have to move the rear projection camera so, uh, yeah, lens. So it was uh, very tricky to do. And uh, it was a combination of rear projection and the real thing and so on. As Pat said... Uh, well, my mother and I were visiting this, the uh, set then and this dear little man that crawled under the merry-go-round actually crawled under when it was going around. This is no trick photography. Oh, he actually crawled around. We're all dying. <laughs> we're dying. We we're, we're just couldn't stand it. I remember about 15 years later, Hitch said, his, my, my hands still yeah, sweat at the thought of this. Really? <laughs> I don't too. Yeah. I he don't was do. terrified that something was going to happen. Oh, we all were. <laughs> yeah. uh, France loved Hitchcock. Yes. Early on. Yes. Yeah. Very much well, so. They understood it faster than we did, you know. Uh, that's typical of uh, American culture is that we need to be told by the French what's good. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing with jazz. You know, people, we just went, Americans like jazz, but they didn't know it was great.
Uh, we all liked Hitchcock, but we didn't know it was great. Uh, the French had to tell us. That's uh, it's not unusual. They're not always right. No, they're not always right, but... Pretty much. Pretty much. <laughs> pretty, pretty much. <laughs> uh, this exhibition runs from April 15th through August 17th. Correct. And uh, the film retrospective ends in the middle of June, yeah. and then it goes on to actually Paris yeah. and, uh, and London. And behind the silhouette stays up until the middle of August. We also have a website that will stay up continually and uh, oh, man. beyond August. He made how many films? What's the number? Uh, 52, 52. 52, I think. Yeah. yeah. It just goes on not and on. Count, not counting the TV yeah. films. 19, I, I've got a, maybe this is a, a total list, from November 13th, 1922, the first, right, unfinished. All right. I always tell your wife 1923 was a, the, the next. It went all the way through Topaz, 1969, Frenzy, 1972, and Family Plot, 1976, Family Plot was, the last, was one. the last one. Yes. He died at what age? 80. 80. 80. Wow. And my mother died in 82. She mm. worked with him all the way along. Yeah. Uh, he, if he would find a story, he would come back, have her read it, and see, do you think it'll make a picture? If she said yes, fine. If she said no, he didn't even look at it. Now, somebody who watched this conversation so far would say to me, you've forgotten one of the more important questions, which is, why did he put himself in every film? It started in the early days in London when anybody who was on the set went in the crowd. Yeah. And then I think he just started acting, and they thought it was funny. Yeah. So that just it became, caught on. But it became very difficult for him because, especially after the television show when he became so well known, he had to be do his little walk on early on before he started building any plot because all the audience goes, There he is. There and he they were is. looking for it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. For it until it was yeah. over. You know, yeah. it's, it's the first thing in North by Northwest. He gets rid yeah. of it very quickly. Yeah. Again, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Patricia. Thank, thank you, you, Lawrence. Uh, MoMA, August, April 15th to August 17th. We'll be right back. Stay with us. <laughs>